thank you everyone for joining us today for today's event, interviewing the future early career scientist one-on-one -on -one with Curtis Calva. My name is Paige Graff and we are broadcasting to you from the NASA Johnson Space Center. Here with me, of course, is Suzanne Foxworth, who is helping in the chat window, and also our featured speaker, Curtis Calva, and the person who will be interviewing him, Julie Fouché. So thanks to all of you for joining us. And just to sort of mention, for those of you that are on the line or whether you're watching the archive, um, we welcome all of you from 16 different states across the United States, and we have students representing grades K through 12 plus. So we've got some adults on the line who never stop that love of learning as well. So thanks to all of you for joining us. We're so excited to share Curtis as well as Julie. And we always have upcoming events, or at least periodically we do. So feel free to always check our website so that you don't miss any future events that we may be holding. So with that, Again, welcome everyone. I'm gonna turn things over to Julie. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll turn things right over to Julie and Curtis. So thanks, Julie and Curtis. It's all you. Yay, and I hope our mic is coming in okay. Paige, are we all right? Sounds good. You're coming through loud and clear. Yay, I hope everybody on the line can hear us or can we get a hand raise, guys? Are we all right? I'll wait. Looks like we're doing pretty good. Awesome. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here with everybody today. Curtis, are you hyped? I'm pretty excited. I am too. <laughs> so we, like Paige said, we have people from 16 different states, um, and I can't believe that. So everybody who's tuning in at home, thank you. This is amazing. I really appreciate you coming out. I know we're just kind of getting back into the, the swing of school and stuff. So taking time out is very generous of you and it is our privilege to be beaming into your classrooms or wherever you're joining us from. Uh, so I am a science engagement specialist at Astro Materials Research Exploration Science and Curtis is a meteorite scientist. And one of the things that I do as part of my job is find out what scientists do and then I get to share that with the public. And one of the ways I do that is by interviewing scientists. And instead of just doing that in my office and kind of grilling them with questions, I thought it would be really fun to kind of share this experience with you. So today we're kind of going to be learning together, which I feel like is very fun. Uh, and Curtis, you're going to be telling me a little bit about like how you got into meteorites and how, I don't know, like what, what meteorites really are. Uh, and like if I wanted to go back to school and if I wanted to become a meteorite scientist, how I could do that. Um, and I think that's kind of where we'll start. So I know your name is Curtis Calva because you're like right down the office and there's yes. a sign on his door. So I've got, I've got, I've got that. <laughs> I've got that down. And I even, just so everybody knows, I'm a very studious person. I have my notebook. I have my pen. I'm so ready. Okay. So what is, what does it actually mean to be a meteorite scientist? So what that means is, for me, I'm a meteorite processor in the meteor Antarctic Meteorite Laboratory here at the Johnson Space Center. And what that means is that we hold on to a lot of the samples and we receive a lot of samples from the uh, Antarctic expedition. They go to Antarctica every year, collect a bunch of meteorites, and then they send them back to us. And we do a lot of the initial descriptions and then we uh, usually we'll break off a chip of that and send it off to the Smithsonian, although they will give it its official uh, classification. So all of the rocks that you work on are from, or they're collected in Antarctica? Exactly. What? Yep. Do, you have, do you ever get to go to Antarctica? Uh, I can apply to go. And, <laughs> uh, I'm working, you have to write, you have to handwrite a letter. So the... Oh. The, okay. the gentleman in charge. Making yeah. notes on this. Yeah. You, you have to hand write a letter to him, and then he reads the letters, and he uh, he will decide who goes. And you don't even have to be, you know, a, a meteorite scientist or a geologist or a scientist in general. He'll usually accept um, able-bodied individuals if they can bring something to the team. That's awesome. So even though I'm not technically a trained geologist yet, I could possibly still apply to go down there and like 
search for meteorites to bring back here. Definitely. So how do you, I guess, what does it mean to like study the rocks once they come back from Antarctica? What does it mean? Like, and how, how did they, like, how do we know it's a meteorite? What, what is, what is a meteorite? Like, what's the difference between that and some cool rock that I found in my backyard that I'm really fond of? Exactly. <laughs> so that, that's one of the things we'll look at. Um, they train the scientists, or they train the team that goes to Antarctica to recognize meteorites. Um, meteorites will usually have a, like a fusion crust where they've entered the atmosphere and they burn up. So it's kind of like a marshmallow. So it'll be burnt on the outside. Uh, and then- Not edible. No. And then another uh, very distinct feature is that they're going to be very dense, very heavy, because there's going to be a lot of iron in them. Okay. And then another thing, if you can see it, they'll sometimes have little tiny circular uh, inclusions that are called chondrules. Okay. And do they all, do they all have those features? Not all of them, but most of them will have iron, some larger iron content okay. than what you would see from an, ore, an iron ore. And I know we have in our presentation, and I'm going to pop it up because um, it was, you sent me some pictures of meteorites, and I am going to share that with you guys. Da, da, da. We're going to jump ahead in it because I feel like you said, I don't know what these things are, but you're going to tell me. But you said, so these are some meteorites that yes. you've worked on or that you've seen or similar to ones you've worked on? I may have seen those in the last <laughs> point in time. We have thousands of meteorites from Antarctica. And, um, okay. And what, can you tell me a little bit about like this one? Okay. So these are what we refer to as ordinary chondrites. They're called chondrites because they have those little circular grains called chondrules, and then they're ordinary because they're the most common. They're still, you know, awesome, amazing rocks because they come from space, but we call them ordinary because they're the most common meteorites. On these ones in particular, especially the one you have your mouse over, you can see the nice dark, almost black fusion crust where it ended the atmosphere and okay. it got burnt up. And is this on the center one? So exactly. that would be that too. Okay. Exactly, right. So when we say something has a chondral, what is that? A chondral? Yes. So chondrals are these little uh, circular, like spherical actually particles okay. that'll be in these meteorites. And they're thought to be some of the oldest material in our solar system. And those chondrals aren't going to appear on terrestrial rocks or rocks from Earth. Okay. Wow. So what happens is where did, like where are these from in our solar system? So meteorites could be they could have a, a number of different sources. We have uh, meteorites from the moon. We okay. have meteorites from uh, Mars, and then we have meteorites from a bunch of different asteroid bodies. And are we able to tell where those are from? Like when we're looking at them, like can we pick it up and go Mars? No, you have okay. to definitely uh, do a lot of scientific studies and, and put them into a lot of different scientific instruments to really analyze what is in that rock. All right, so they've made their way to us from space. They, some of them, um, or all of them, have burned up in some way through Earth's atmosphere. Some of them have a very visible, what we're calling a fusion crust. Yes. And then they land all over, but we get ours from Antarctica. Yes. And then they come to your lab, and then you do what to them? We will. Well, we receive them frozen. Okay. And so then we put them in a cabinet uh, that doesn't have any oxygen in it, because if you have uh, something that has a lot of iron in it, and then you leave it exposed to oxygen, it'll rust. So we try to keep it um, as little, exp little exposed to oxygen as possible so it doesn't rust. So we try them out. And then after we dry them out, we'll do a lot of the initial descriptions. We'll weigh them, measure the dimensions, uh, measure how magnetic they are. And then uh, we'll break them open, essentially, to do a, a, a sort of hand sample, what we call hand sample description, so what we can see with our eyeball and maybe like a small hand lens. 
and we'll write all those things down and we'll take note of all that. And then we break off a little tiny chip and we send that off to the Smithsonian where they will do, uh, they'll put it into an instrument and they'll do a more in-depth analysis of it to give us an official classification. So this looks like, I guess it sounds like it's a big team effort. So there's the team that goes to Antarctica, exactly. there's the team that works here, and now you're telling me the Smithsonian also works yes. on this too? Yes. What it, is this like, do you guys have a club? Is this a... So the organization is called uh, ANSMIN, and that's the Antarctic Search for Meteorites. Because NASA loves acronyms. <laughs> exactly. So uh, does ANSMET, um, and you said anybody can be, or anybody can potentially be on that team that goes to Antarctica. Yes. But there's very special people that become meteorite scientists. Yes. And there's very special people, I assume, that are working at Smithsonian who are also meteorite scientists. Oh yes. Okay. <laughs> and so let's talk about how did how did you get into meteorite science? Like, there's these amazing rocks. They come from space. Uh, they land in Antarctica and they show up in your office. What? Where? Where are you? Are you from space? No, no, no. Okay, that's fair. As, as far as I know, I'm from Earth. All right, <laughs> so you're terrestrial then. Yes. Okay, confirmed. Curtis is terrestrial. Thank you, Curtis. <laughs> so tell us about where you're from. We have we have people joining us from everywhere today, uh, 16 different states. So and I've lived in a few of those. So I've I've lived all over. You said you've also lived a few places. I, yes, I was. So I was born in Louisiana. Okay. And then uh, I've lived in. Colorado, as well as Oklahoma, but I've lived the most majority of my life here in Texas. Awesome, and I know we have a few schools from Texas joining us, so, <laughs> and we're currently in Texas right now at exactly. the Johnson Space Center, so, exciting. Um, what, how did you, I guess, so you are in Texas now, what is your background education, and how does, how do you go into meteorites, like, is there, do you just, after high school, go to your college and say, I'm here to work with space rocks, and then just bang down the door. I mean, you could potentially do that, but, but <laughs> that's not the best route. Uh, maybe not, but one of the things you could definitely do uh, if you're interested in sort of astro materials or meteorites is you could go. Uh, myself, I got a bachelor's of science degree from the University of Houston. Okay. And then I continued my education and got a master's in geology at the University of Houston. Okay. And so that definitely helps because these are rocks and geology is the study of, you know, the earth and of rocks. So that definitely helps. Awesome. So it helps to have a background in rocks. So this is a question for everybody out there. Uh, and I am going to ask you guys to weigh in. Um, I know when I was a kid, I, I actually loved rocks. <laughs> I would go out and collect them in my backyard. Um, and I'd bring them in, sometimes covered in mud which my mom was a little bit not happy about. That's okay, they were my fave. Is anybody out there studying rocks, either as a hobby or in your classes with your teachers? Um, if you want to, if you could put that answer in the Q&A or weigh in in the chat. And we're gonna give you a second answer and we are waiting with bated breath. Yes, I, I definitely collected a lot of rocks when I was a child. It was, it was a lot of fun. I had a... I had a little box that I would keep all of my favorite rocks in, and that was that was my treasure chest of rocks. When, when I was really young, uh, my parents used to go through my backpack because I would have tons <laughs> of rocks in my backpack, so I had rocks and sand in my backpack all the time. You've been to is this any mineral education day? Oh, New England. Oh, that Rock sounds down. so fun. I see some people who have rock collections of your own. Thank you for validating me. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> you study class. Oh, awesome. I okay, I don't even know the rock cycle. Can you, you do you know what this is? Yeah, so there's there's a rock, there's this uh, rock cycle, and mm -hmm. you have Randall Middle, thank you. You you got me on that one. You could have sort of any starting point in the cycle, but you have sedimentary and then well, you have, let's start with igneous because that's easy, but you have igneous rocks. Just like the, uh, the well, layer picture that I'm thinking uh, of? Not so much. It's like a circle, but there's no real rhyme or rhythm. It can go from one to another, but you have igneous rocks on it, metamorphic rocks, sedimentary rocks, and they can all sort of be either eroded or recycled into one another. That's amazing. Okay. 
And that's, I, I feel like Randall Middle is probably out there just like, yeah, <laughs> they know. Let's see, I'm so excited. Downs, you guys, thank you. Grade five learned about rocks when studying geosphere. Oh, geos. Oh, wow. <laughs> Duxbury Senior Center collecting rocks since forever. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> yes. And Downstead Elementary studying geodes. Oh, there's some beautiful geodes at our um, Houston Museum of Natural the yeah, History Museum. Yeah, there's a huge plant. one that I could like think into. One. Right. Yes, I feel like I, I want to walk into it's it. It's the size of a car, small car. <laughs> I'm not allowed to walk into it, but I would like to. <laughs> you had, thank you so much. Those are great answers. Thank I, I you love, so much. I love geodes. My my nieces gave me geodes for Christmas, and we love to crack them open. It's always so much fun. <laughs> I haven't ever gotten one that you get to crack open yourself. I always got the ones that Burn. were already done for me. That's I'm. I feel like I need to. Uh, I need to step up my rock game again. Okay. Um. So somebody has asked, and before we move on, I'm gonna. Ask, I'm going to kind of go backwards. So uh, San Benito High School, this is a great question. Why do we only collect our rocks from Antarctica? So we, that's just part of what uh, our, our uh, sort of team was set up to do, is collect them from Antarctica. You can find them from all over, but Antarctica is a really good place because it's a, a desert and it's very cold. So whenever they land, there's not a lot of uh, other moisture besides the ice that they land on, and the ice actually keeps them in a really good condition, keeps them nice and cold. Yeah. So, and like I said, it's a bit of a desert, as well as the way that the, the ice migrates across the um, Trans-Antarctic mountain range. It, the ice will move across the mountains, and it'll basically drop all the meteorites off kind of on another side of the mountains. So it makes it really easy to find them. Okay, versus just having to try and go out and exactly. randomly search for them. But you can find meteorites all over the place. There's a bunch from like Northwest Africa, Australia, Canada, all over the place. You can maybe even find them in your backyard. So head middle magnet uh, lions, I think that kind of answers your question. So they all meteorites don't land in Antarctica, but it's a really great place to, for us to collect them for scientific study. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. And then let's see. Ooh, Otisfield Community School asks, are there Mars meteorite scientists or do all meteorite scientists study all meteorites? So do you like specialize? So there, I have met um, other meteorite scientists that are actively doing a lot of research in the field, and some of them will specialize. There was, I've met uh, a scientist that specialized in carbonaceous meteorites, so those are meteorites that have a lot of carbon in them. Okay. And then I've met meteorites that specialize in Martian meteorites as well, so those are the samples that are uh, about to have been, come from Mars. And then of course, uh, there are people that just specialize in just any kind of meteorite that they can kind of get their hands on. That's awesome yeah. though. So you can you can specialize, but you can also just have all the meteorites. Exactly, exactly. Do you specialize or are you in like every meteorite is? I'm, I'm still kind of new to the game. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just trying to learn as much as I can from all of these uh, really smart individuals with me here and just that I meet at conferences. That's fair. So kind of going back to getting in, like in school, so you said you have a background in geology and more geology. Did you have favorite classes? Like we have a bunch of people joining us from schools. So did you either like when you were really young in high school or in college, was there a favorite class that really drove you or that just made you really excited about science and working with rocks? So, Other than geology? Yeah, so, <laughs> I guess geology is the easy one there. So growing up, uh, you know, it's, it was just kind of natural for me to collect rocks. But when I was in high school, you know, you sort of grow up and people are like, maybe you shouldn't collect rocks all the time. Don't let those people discourage you. Collect as many rocks as you would <laughs> like. But uh, in high school, I took uh, a lot of chemistry and I had a really good teacher in high school. She really inspired me to just continue in education and science. And I'm, I glad, I'm glad I had that inspiration in my life. And while that was chemistry and not really, I guess, geology, uh, for my graduate thesis, I did a lot of what we call geochemistry. So it was basically chemistry of the rocks that we were looking at. Okay. And so um, do, you, do you want to name drop your teacher? Uh, her name was Dr. Spearing. Yeah. I, I don't know what she's <laughs> teaching anymore, but she was, she was phenomenal. She was very smart. Chemistry was one of my favorite classes when I was younger. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> so Especially I didn't know you could do chemistry of rocks, though. Did, yeah, you can. It's it's what we call solid solution chemistry. So we're not using like liquids to okay. make a solution. Uh, these are 
we just like look at the rock as a whole and then be like, all right, it's already kind of in a solution and we kind of just analyze different minerals and their compositions. That's awesome. So did you have, other than that teacher, did you have other influential teachers or professors that in any point in your career that kind of, or your educational career rather, that kind of pushed you towards geology or made you, that made you not give up rocks or made you put your rocks back in the garden? Uh, no, I just had, I, she was the most influential, but I had a, at the high school that I attended, there was a lot of, um, the science department was really fun and I would actually go eat lunch with the science teachers, kind of a nerd thing to do, but it was a lot of fun to hang out with them and we would just talk about different things that were happening in classes. So it helps me to boost my grades, to talk to my teachers frequently. And then it just, we talked about other things that weren't discussed in classes. And that was helpful. That's cool. So what, like, so you had an interest in rocks, but those were rocks that you could find here on Earth. What got you interested first in space and NASA? So when I was really young, we moved here to Texas. And being around the Space Center, I mean, just in the city of Houston, there's NASA is all over the place. People love NASA. They call it, they call it Houston Space City. That's one of the names of it. So, and there's just a lot of, uh, a lot of local just restaurants and stores and shops are really pushing the space theme. For, I mean, <laughs> our basketball team is called the Rockets, and our baseball team is called the Astros. Astros. It's, it's all dealing with space. So we do, all we do love space here a lot. And so, <laughs> and so that was really fun to be to grow up close to that. And then at the University of Houston, there was a lot of professors that worked uh, very closely with some of the NASA scientists. So it's kind of like having it on all sides and being around here made you really excited about it. Was there any, did you grow up with any of the space programs or? I know I did, but. I, uh, when I was growing up, the shuttle program was a lot of fun to watch. It's true. Yeah. And I think, I don't know if, uh, I know some of the adults watching probably grew up with the shuttle program or watched the shuttle program in its entirety. Um, and I'm really excited for the next generation to get to watch Artemis. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited. You guys are going to get, you guys are the Artemis generation. This is very touching for me that you get to watch us go to the moon again. It'd be a lot of fun. Oh. Uh, so when, like, we talked a little bit about processing your meteorites, and I skipped through some of the lab pictures because I wanted you to be able to really dig deep into that. And some kids, uh, some classes and stuff have some really cool questions. And I'm wondering, um, so people are asking to see our video full screen. I am... We're gonna skip that, but only so that we can go back to here, because um, I want you guys to be able to see inside the lab with Curtis. Uh, these, so you talked about processing the meteorites. Yes. And you said at first they have to be dried out, but they can't be dried out with oxygen. Mm -hmm. How how do you how do you dry them out without oxygen? So we keep them in a really big freezer. First of all, when they come. Okay. And then we give them their official name. Okay. And their official name will have three letters, three to four, yeah, about three to four letters, and that'll be the location where they were found. Okay. And then there'll be two numbers, and that'll be the year of the expedition. Okay. And then the following numbers will be the generic number, so that'll be sort of its official uh, number of how we can find it. So when you, but, like, the and the letters correspond to when you say where, so are they all A and T Antarctica? No, there's, okay. different, there's different locations in Antarctica. It's sort Got of been it. split up into different regions. Okay. And there's a map for that that we'll include in when I send out kind of the final email. There is a great map of that. Um, it's really, you need to have a really big version of it so you can really zoom in on all the locations. There's tons of them. So what happens when they get to, what is, so what is, what is this space? Is this? So this is a, a flow bench. Oh, okay. So this is where we do all of the process and we handle all of uh, the meteorites on a bench like this because it's got the air pushing out and it's, it's a very clean bench. Um, we wipe it down all the time and we, just, we get new tools and whenever we process new samples and everything, we don't want to contaminate anything. We want everything to be as uh, pristine as we, can, as we found it as we feel. And so this bench allows us to handle and work on samples in that manner. Got it. And when you go into the lab, do you go in just wearing this? Oh, definitely not. Oh, okay. no, we, we suit up, we, we put on a, a big smock and a cap to cover our hair. Okay. And then we step in a air shower. So it'll just blow air on us to get all the particles and dust off of us. And then we can go into the lab. Thank you, Yeah. So this right here is this 
That that's one of the air showers. That's, <laughs> that's an inactive one. Okay, but that's where you can would, stand would, on there. Yeah, it would look like that. You stand up on a little uh, like a grate, and then it blows all the particles out of you. Amazing. And is this so? This cabinet right here is this also? Do you process meteorites in here too? Yes, we. Uh, that. Cabinet is reserved for processing Martian meteorites. Oh, so only some meteorites get processed only in a big, like a closed cabinet. Exactly. Only specific samples get processed in there, and we keep those samples put away into another uh, cabinet that's very clean, and so they don't get contaminated. Wow. So have, and this is a question for all of you out there, have any of you gotten to work in a lab yet, either at school, um, I know I was doing, I think some of my, my youngest memories of lab work were dissecting owl pellets, um, which I really enjoyed. But have any of you gotten to do any work doing like dissections or lab work? Um, and how much fun was it? Did you enjoy it? And I'll give you guys a minute to type into the chat. And I will wait for you to type for us. <laughs> I think it was like, we started with owl pellets. I know that's a bioscience, but then we went into, that was before we got to like right. real chemistry um, in like middle school. I think one of the first things we did was create like silly putty with- Oh yeah, like, like and slime. And yeah. Powder. Yep, like, yep. But we did owl pellets. We dissected a few creatures. Um, I do, I do remember making slime now. That was a lot of fun. That was a good chemistry experiment, actually. Anybody out there have some good like lab experiences or working in labs? If you've worked in a rock lab, please share and let us know. Wow, I see Downs Elementary School. You said um, that you've been to labs and museums and have done lab work in school. That's amazing. Museum labs are super cool. I've, I've gotten to work in a couple, and they are just phenomenally interesting. Very fancy. They're very, very fancy. <laughs> and let's see, we've got Randall Middle uh, Student Spaceflight Experiments Program. What? Mm. You guys, that's awesome. Uh, let's see, Microgravity Research. That's awesome. Rock excavating kits. OK, those are. That's oh, cool. Acadia. Oh, this field. That's I love that national park. It's beautiful. <laughs> Camped awesome. up there. Oh, geology sorting at Acadia would be awesome. Yeah. Oh, the rock structures up there are super cool. I've never been to that one. And we've got. I see we have some Q and A. So let's. So we're gonna. Do, do, do. So some of the, Miss uh, Dooley. Miss Dooley from, is this Miss Dooley from Downs Elementary? Got to go uh, School of Rocks at Texas a and It was in Antarctica for two months. That's so cool. I see Randall, owl pellets, flowers, rock mining. Oh, and we did do flowers. Yeah. I forgot about that. You do the, yep. Collection, collection of flowers. Sinkhole labs? Oh, that's cool. What? <laughs> I don't even think I got to do those. And then, so we've got some questions in here. Um, and uh, just to backtrack, Otis Field asks, how many years have you been working as a meteorite scientist? How many years? This is my first year. It's not even been a year. Not even so a year yet. It's, yeah, I mean, how, how many years as a geologist? How many years as a geologist? I've been doing it for um, maybe about Eight to ten years. So eight to ten years as a geologist and first year as a meteorite scientist. So and then let's see. We're gonna scroll back. Um this is I like this question a lot. When you were Otis Field, when you were in elementary school, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh geez. <laughs> I think I, I probably wanted to play sports of some kind because of, um, my family was very active with sports. Uh, my, my mom actually played basketball in college. <laughs> so I love basketball. And then I, I played some other sports. Basketball was a lot of fun. I was always hoping to be a basketball player, but that didn't really end up. <laughs> I'm too short. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm too short. I'm 5'11 and I'm too short for basketball. Oh, actually, that's not true. There are, there are some. There are some 
positions. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, I feel like I'm not, I can't move that fast. Yeah. <laughs> Agile, there we go. You guys, these are, oh, you have so many good experiences and so many cool labs. Oh, I also have, is it Bumpus Mine to Rock Hounds? That's, awesome. oh, I have a, I have a second screen up here to read you guys chat responses. And it's so cool. I can't believe you guys have so much lab work experience. Um, you're making me feel inadequate. I don't think I've done this much lab work. So thank you for sharing. These are, these are incredible. And all of them sound like a ton of fun. That's, I'm, I'm sincerely jealous of some of you. You guys that have, you guys have had a lot of experiences and have had a great time, it sounds like. Um, and some of your questions are actually um, being answered in the PowerPoint, and I'm just going to hop back into it. Because uh, you were asking asking about the processing of meteorites, okay. so uh, and like how you break open meteorites, um, and yeah. so I know we had you had some tool pictures, and these okay. are some of the things that you use. Exactly. In, every every day in the lab, we can we'll be using some we'll be using tools similar to these. So safety glasses. Exactly. That's I know I've used those, and I'm pretty sure you have all used safety glasses. S- safety first, always. Safety first, every so time. Whenever we're some of the larger ones we'll need to put into this circular bowl right here, and then we'll use a, ch- a hammer and chisel okay. to, to sort of hammer and crack them open. But of course, we have safety goggles, and then we even use ear protection because it can be kind of loud. And so these long, like these uh, two pieces right here, that these are chisels actually. Exactly. Okay, and so this end that I'm pointing to with my mouse, these are kind of the, sh- the sharp, I those, guess? Yeah, those They're are not, the edges. Okay, so these are the chipping edges that you would put is that again, like that's that against the rock? Those would be put against the meteorite, and we've actually sort of destroyed a bunch of them because some of the meteorites do have a lot of iron, and they can be very dense and very hard. Wow. Okay. And then, so you'll sometimes will be in this. You set a chipping bowl, and then you use a chisel and a hammer, and put it against the rock, and then you try and break it apart. Exactly. And our, we're not doing this for fun. I mean, it's fun, but this is work. Okay, <laughs> what do we do on the? What are we? What are we doing with it once it breaks open? Uh, well, that's how. So for some of them, they're just covered in fusion crust. So okay. You can't see sort of what um, what makes up them from the eye, from like our sort of observations. And remember, the fusion crust is that like charred marshmallow outside that we talked about at the beginning. So when it came through the atmosphere, and it you said it burns up just a little bit and it comes in <laughs> and it lands, some of them will be completely covered so we can't see what's inside of it and that's when you're gonna chip it open to get what's inside of it. And so okay. after we chip it open, we can see what's inside of it and that's where we can do an observational description. Wow, okay. And then is this just a, a bigger hammer? That's actually a smaller hammer. Oh, this is, so, okay. So we have smaller hammers on the bench with smaller smaller chipping bowls because it's a larger the, bowl. So we can use now? those. Mm-hmm. This is a smaller hammer. Mm-hmm, okay. Exactly. And then we have scissors because we'll need to cut open some of the bags that some of the samples are in. And then we use tweezers to pick up smaller samples. We have larger tweezers to pick up larger samples. And of course, there's a ruler in all the pictures because every good geologist needs a scale in their images. <laughs> and then. Um, What's a little cube? Is so, that is that dice? Is this for no, like D&D? I wish. That'd be this kind is of not fun. Okay. But that's an orientation cube. So oh. some of the samples we need to we need to have a set orientation on them so we can document where we break off little chunks of it. So just like the ruler helps you find scale, this will help you orient it in the 3D space. Exactly. Okay, got it. All right, so I I think we have maybe, whoa, is this for when too many pieces get broken off? Yes, exactly. So we'll have a lot of dust on the bench and we gotta sweep it all up and gather it and collect it. And then pieces go, are these just little these are, just little containers? Yes, these are containers that we store some of the smaller samples in. The, we have the aluminum container there, and then, yes, and then we have a stainless, I believe it's a stainless steel container with the Teflon lid, the white lid. Okay, so this is Teflon. Mm-hmm. Okay. The stainless and, then, steel, Teflon. and then these are plastic uh, vials that we can put samples in as well. It depends on how big the sample is and things like that. So. Wow. Okay. This is this is super complex, but I love it. And is there is there a reason we only use certain types of like materials? Yes. Uh, we only allow certain materials into the lab, and these are materials that are deemed safe for lab because 
they're they sort of inert, they won't really re react or have any adverse effects or contaminate the samples. Okay, so we're looking for things that won't contaminate exactly. the sample or get the sample uh, messy in any way or, okay. And then I think this one, I know you told me about this one and I included it because it's one of my favorite oh, and it's coolest fun. things. It's fun. Please explain what this is to everybody. So this is our rock splitter, and we can use this to break, <laughs> when we don't want to use a hammer and chisel and we have a smaller sample, we can use the rock splitter to break off little little chunks of it. And it essentially has two chisels that um, sort of bite down onto each other. And it'll right just, here. Exactly. Okay. And it'll just crack open and break off a little piece of the rock. It's, I, I, I wish I could see this in action. In, it is one of the, it's one of those pieces that you showed me from the lab that I was very excited about and I was like, you have to explain this to everybody. Okay, so we had a lot of questions come in and so we are gonna stop sharing and go to full screen and we're gonna try and answer a bunch of these. You guys have so many questions and I love it. So this one we've answered. Um, we got this one. Ooh, Otis Field Community School asks, what is the largest meteorite that has ever been found and where was it from? Where was it found? Or that you know of? I'm I'm actually not sure about that question. I know there's I, been a few. I believe the largest one landed in Africa, but I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. I know there. Where's like? Is that like in you mean modern times? Well, the the hard, the largest one that's been intact, right? Oh. Because the one that formed Meteor Crater was another really large one. I hear that's about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. And what is what is Meteor Crater for anybody who doesn't know? That's uh that's actually a national park. Is it Arizona or is that New Mexico? <laughs> it's so bad. It's, like it's a huge park and it's a huge crater. I've seen it from yeah. a, I've seen it from an airplane flying over it. I know that. Arizona. Arizona. Page, page coming through. But yeah, Big Lou is the largest one in our lab. Uh, he's a he's a big one. It's huge. How big is so the biggest one in our lab is Big Lou and do we know how I know I've I've heard of it and I've seen a picture of it and I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, it's I keep doing this to signify to you size. I I understand for everyone watching from home that's not a good scale, but it's one of those. It feels like something that I would have to hug and wrap my arms around. It's very big, and even that is not the largest. <laughs> and I know you were saying. Um, we're going to get back to you, Otis. Otis Hill, we're going to come back to that question. That's a good one. There have been a lot of big ones. Oh. I believe it is 250 pounds. It's the largest one that we've found in Antarctica so far. And they've actually, they actually have the joke about it because it, it fell twice. Because it fell the first time, and then they were trying to lift it out again, and they accidentally dropped it back. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, that's right, because it was so... Yeah. Is that an is that an iron meter? No, no, no. I believe it's just ordinary. Okay. And then, what is the smallest meteorite found? Is also Otis Field Community School. Oh, geez, smallest. We have some that are not even a gram. So they're okay. they're very tiny. We have some that are very tiny. Those are, those and are fun. We'll also send out a link at the end that'll go to the database website. And the database can be. It's mostly designed for scientists looking for specific, um, like specific meteorites but I encourage you to kind of browse it and have fun with it. But there's pictures, I mean, even these little tiny ones that we get, we still photograph and post things about it. And you're yeah. welcome to, it's all open to the public. You can look through the samples and there's tons of pictures of them. So even these little bitty ones that we get, there's pictures of it. It's, and you'll be able to see it next to, as Curtis pointed out, um, a ruler and an orientation cube. And then let's see, I'm gonna go back to the top. Uh, great questions, Otis Field. Head middle magnet lions, what is the average time it takes for a meteorite to fall to Earth? Oh, so it could take probably millions of years for it to actually get to the atmosphere and then actually falling, that'd probably be maybe hours. So it and you're saying that could be from wherever it's from. So exactly. from the asteroid belt, from Mars, wherever it broke off of. Exactly. Great question, head middle. Um, and we have head middle magnet all good. How do we transport the meteorites? And I'm guessing um, from Antarctica. So how do we get them from Antarctica back here? So from what I understand, they put them into what's a large like plastic 
box, I believe. It's like an isopod is what they call them. Okay. And then I think they put, they, they, they might, I'm not sure what they put. They might put dry ice in there to keep them cold, but they do whatever they can to keep them frozen because they were found on ice. So they're frozen and they might sell ice on them. So we, we want to keep them cold the exactly. whole time. Exactly. So we don't want that ice to melt because then they'll rust. And then they come by, so they come in their pod, and do we take them by, by boat, or are they flown? I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember that one. I know they, I think it depends. I've seen um, the ANZMET blog has taken yes. a few different types of transportation yes. out. They, yeah, they use helicopters to get out in the field, and then they probably use planes, throw them on the plane. And I think it depends on what the weather is and what they have access to runway wise. Exactly. Well, runway wise. The <laughs> there weather, we go. The weather in Antarctica is very harsh. And good, great question. Head middle magnet, all good. Um, and then we have what's an estimate to the number of meteorites found so far from Otis Field Community School? Oh, we've thousands. Just our collection I'm not is. Sure. I'm not sure how many we have in there, but we have. Just literal like tens of thousands. So, and that's just what's in our collection. There's no telling. I mean, with and amateur then, collectors and yeah, and other the collections. A lot of <laughs> what we have here, though, we'll send to the Smithsonian, so they have even more than we did. And um, so, head middle magnet lions. You asked uh, what types of tools do you classify meteorites, and I think we answered this uh, in the last part. But if you have more questions about any of those tools. Let us know like if you want us to go into more depth on those. Uh, New Mexico Museum of Space History, do you know of any plans to go to ice moons that would include looking for meteorites on the ice there? I'm not sure about that one. I, I, haven't, I haven't heard anything about that. But that would be really cool. <laughs> but, but I know that uh, NASA has the OSIRIS-REx mission right now, and that is a probe that's orbiting an asteroid, and they're going to land on the asteroid. And, not land. Or not land. They're not gonna, land. They're going to... Touch and go. Yeah, just touch and, touch and go. I'm just going to touch and go. And so they're going to get some sample and then come back, and that'll be a nice return sample. And when that sample comes back, where does it go? It'll go to us. It goes to us. <laughs> Not to us, but it comes to Aries at JSC, and we're very excited about it because it means we'll have a new lab and exactly. new scientists, and that'll be very exciting. Uh, great question, New Mexico. Uh, Otis Field Community School asks What other skills other than a science background are important? That's a great question. That's a great one. I enjoyed my uh, reading and writing classes. I was never the best at it, but my teachers worked with me. And knowing how to communicate, especially with science, is very important. I know you also mentioned one time that you really loved art history. Like... I absolutely love art history. <laughs> I, I loved art. I took a lot of art classes as a kid. Uh, and that actually translates really well to geology, because we have to do a lot of drawing in the field. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, exactly. And so that was nice. And then I like history and art history sort of combines both of them. Great question, Otis Hill Community School. Uh, and we have head middle magnet lions. When a meteorite lands, could it cause a fire? Hmm, maybe. I know they create impacts, large craters. So I know there are fireballs. Be a big boom. I've seen fireballs like on dash cam footage. If, yeah, if they're large enough, you'll see a fireball come through the the air and um, you might they might set some dry foliage on fire, some dry plants. But, We're gonna have to look that up. But I I personally am unfamiliar. Yes. And then Corpus Christi Catholic School asks, would it be possible? Oh, you're just asking for the screen. We're here. <laughs> we did it. Uh, we did that. And then let's see. Oh, how can you tell the difference between space rocks and earth rocks if you're rock hunting in your backyard? If you're rock hunting in your backyard. So Corpus Christi Catholic School, you are one of a few people, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people who wanted to know this. Um, you can meteorite hunt on your own. Like exactly. it's, you can totally do meteorite hunting in your backyard and around your house. Micro meteorites are falling uh, all the time. So. How do you yes. tell the so, <laughs> so one of the ways you could hunt in your backyard is to go and get a magnet. Okay. All right. And so what any kind of, like can I use a fridge magnet or am I gonna need a I'm probably gonna need a kind of stronger magnet. Okay. So a strong scientific magnet. If you, Got it. You can get a hold of one. And then you're gonna just if 
you find a rock and it's magnetic, it, that doesn't mean that it's a meteorite, but that means it has a lot of iron in it. Got it. And so meteorites typically have a lot of iron in it, so that's that's a starting indication. That's okay. not the, that's not the only one you need. Um, a lot of times meteorites will have, like we said, the fusion crust, where you can see where they burn up. And then if you can get maybe um, like magnifying glass or a hand lens, then you can look closer and see, look at the like the little grains of the rock. Got it. And if you can find chondrules, then it's a meteorite. But chondrules can be hard to hard to spot because they can be really small or they can be a little bit larger. Okay. So those are those are really good questions. And for those of you who have been rock hunting or meteorite hunting in your backyard, those are some tips. Um, you could also, I guess, try and take them to like a museum and see if somebody there. Sometimes they do workshops around these things. Mm -hmm. uh, I will dismiss that one. Um, Downs Elementary asks, how large is the largest meteorite that you have worked with? I've worked with, uh, I've, yeah, I've worked with some meteorites that are over a thousand grams. Which is, and that's that's not big loo size. That's no, like... no, that's <laughs> these would be maybe about the size of a football. Okay. But they weigh a lot more than a football. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because of the iron content. Exactly. Got it. Okay, and then just to take a quick break, so we are at kind of a quarter till the hour. It's about eleven forty-five Central Time. So I know we have about fifteen minutes left in the official webinar time, which is usually when we break for questions. But we've just sort of been informally taking them from you guys because you've had so many great, curious questions. And this is an interview, so we're, we're learning together. So that's sort of the point. So we're going to keep going um, for another 10 or so minutes, and then we'll check in again uh, and see where everybody's at and take any like closing remarks. Um, if anybody needs to check in with us before then, um, let me know. Let Paige, uh, Paige Susanna or I know. Um, and I know there's been some, uh, Kim has popped in in the chat. Uh, and also filled in the blanks for us. Uh, thank you, Kim, <laughs> and thank you, Paige. Okay, and we have, there was another really good question about uh, your background, and I'm going to ask you for that. Um, what is the, your favorite part of your job? And this is also from Downs Elementary School. What is the favorite part of my job? I get to hammer and break rocks. That's that's got to be that's <laughs> always a highlight when you get a rock that's just really when you get a large rock that's hard to break with a splitter and you have to get the hammer out. That's always kind of fun. So getting to do the hands-on lab work. Hands-on lab work is a dream come true. <laughs> um, I I don't have a lab, so I I live vicariously through that. <laughs> it's a, it's a lot of fun. And we had a question from. Otisfield Community School asked, students wanted to know how old you have to be to be a scientist. Um, and uh, I think your teacher has told you that it, it turns out that it's probably mostly experience and studies versus actual age. Definitely. I would agree <laughs> with that because you can, while you might not have a, I guess, a job title of scientist, as a kid, you can go and be a scientist and just go and explore the world around you. For sure. I mean, asking, I mean, applying the scientific method exactly. and asking questions and answering them, forming hypotheses. You're doing the science, but to be a professional scientist, I think it's all about going out there and doing those studies. So it's not really about your age. It's more about where you are in your professional and educational career. Exactly. And you can take that on whenever you're there, whenever you're ready for it. Yeah. That's an awesome question, Otis Fields. Good job. Um, Randall Middle asks, can you talk about your years of study after undergraduate? So I guess your master's degree, you talked a little bit about this, um, you said chemistry and geology together. Was, so yes, my, in graduate school, I spent a lot of time doing geochemistry. Analysis. Okay. So I found a rock, uh, actually I didn't just find rock, uh, my field area was in Montana. So it was at an I area, it was in an area called the, near the Steelwater Mine. And I think I have a picture of this. I think you do. Uh, let's, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint uh, just because it was a really, ooh, meteorites. I think that's you working with the public. Yes. So this is not it. No, close though. Close. 
Right this. here. Okay. So this is my field area. This is near the Stillwater mine in Montana. This is the Stillwater layer matrix intrusion, which is a lot of words, but it basically means that it's um, a bunch of igneous rocks and a large igneous body that were exposed on the surface. What? And, okay. And they're all really unique and weird and crazy. And that was one of the crazy ones. And so I collected a sample and studied that. So you went to this place in Montana, you collected the rock, and then you got to do, you said geochemistry on it, so chemistry, geology combined exactly. on that rock that you collected. Yes. Did you do the geochemistry in Montana, or did you take it back to we did Houston? That. We did a lot of that in Houston. We did a lot of that in Houston. I uh, did some of that uh, up near Dallas as well. Okay. There's a university up there that I worked with. Whoa. And I know I kind of skipped a couple other pictures, but... Um, for field work, is that something that you only do in grad school, or is that something that you also get to do as an undergrad? You can definitely do field work as an undergrad. Hey. You just have to talk to professors. Some professors might have an undergraduate project for you. They might be kind of simple things that you can do. Either it'll be either lab work or out in the field, but lab work is just as fun because you get to use fun instruments. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, and let's see, we've got. Uh, this is a great one from Sneeds Ferry Homeschool. What are meteorites primarily made of? That's a good one. That's and really I'm going to skip back because I, there's, I have a few different meteorite pictures. So this is, we said this one was mostly. This, so this is an iron meteorite. So this is going to be a lot of iron and then you're going to have some nickel in there as well. It's <laughs> going to be extremely heavy. <laughs> And that's, is that, and you said that was typical in some, but not all. So that was exactly. iron and so iron have, and nickel. you're going to have some large iron content. Okay. And then they're all going to have varying levels of uh, silica content as well. And is silica, that sounds it's a, familiar. What is silica? Um, so it's another m molecule that forms minerals in. Uh, Do we, have the, we, have, we have all these on Earth. Yes, okay. definitely. 100%. And then what else? Let's see. I know there's this one. Chondrules are going to be a good sign, but not all meteorites have chondrules. Okay. Um, and then I have the fusion crust. Yeah, but what else, I guess, like makes be made it up? A lot of other minerals, actually. So you're going to see probably a lot of pyrrhic scenes, and then you're going to see a lot of really wacky minerals that we don't necessarily find on Earth. Oh. But we, all, but we have all of those building, but you see all of the building blocks for those minerals on Earth. Okay. So they're kind of familiar to us, but not in that not, order. Not exactly. Okay, so all in different pieces, but not all together like that. Yeah. All right. Good, good question, Sneedsbury. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing so we go back full screen. And let's see, students wanna know how many labs we have from San Benito High School. How many labs? Oh, geez. Uh, if, Kim, if Kim could help us out with that one. We have a lot of different labs. And we're building more. Yeah, we're hopefully adding on a few more as well because we're expecting, you know, Artemis to bring stuff and then Osiris to bring stuff. There's another high boots mission. Yeah, there's there's the high boots of... And all the labs, one of the cool things that you told me was um, they don't, they're not all in the same place. So the moon rocks don't get processed or worked with in the mar or the, the meteorite lab. Definitely not. Okay. We have to keep everything separate and sort of uncontaminated from one another because there's different materials in some of these rocks. So some of the stuff we find in the meteorites aren't going to be in the lunar rocks and we don't want to get those mixed up. And how they're processed is also apparently very different. Oh, yes. Oh, here we go. Thanks for the info, Kim. Also, Kim came back to let us know that Antarctic meteorites are put on a ship in Antarctica that goes to California and then goes by refrigerated truck and there it drives to JSC in Houston. So those meteorites go on a very long journey. Um, I get seasick very easily, so I would not want to be on that trip. Yes, and Paige, excellent. Um, the Aries.jsc.nasa.gov. If you want to find out more about all the different labs and also uh, all different collections we have, that is the place to be. And I'm going to try and get a couple more of these. Let's see. How far, ooh, Corpus Christi Catholic School asks, how far in the ground can meteors be? So how, like, you mean, I guess when they land, like, if they can impact into the ground? The meteorites will be able to impact pretty deep, like, 
for instance, we mentioned meter crater, and that one seems to be pretty deep, but it all depends on the size of the meteorite. And a lot of times you're gonna find them on the surface. They might be a little bit buried by sediment, but they're gonna be on the they're gonna be on the surface. So most of the ones we have are kind of on the surface. Exactly. Okay. You're not gonna really be digging and digging down into the earth to find them. Got it. Uh, I love this question from San Benito High School because I wanted to know this too. How hot do meteorites get when they enter our atmosphere? Because they look like you see them with the fireball that comes in, so I know they're they're very they, warm. They get they get hot enough to turn iron into a sort of molten mush, like we saw with that iron meteorite. That um, and I will go back because I love this. Yeah. Okay. So this yeah. is the iron meteorite. Let me share it to you guys. Wanted to make sure it has the right one. Okay. Right there. Woo. You sure? Hopefully it does. Did it share? Okay, there it is. All right. So yeah. So that, so I mean, <laughs> it, it look at it. It just kind of almost melted iron and then just there. So it gets really hot. I don't know the exact temperature. I apologize. Uh, but it gets hot enough to basically turn it into this weird amalgamation of iron. So this is not what it probably looked like coming through, like when it broke off or came out of the asteroid belt or when it broke off from wherever its parent I, I would, body no. was. No. Oh, so it got that way, getting pitted like that, mm -hmm. coming into our atmosphere. Exactly. Woo! From all the heat. That's warmer than I would like to be. Um, how many meteorites do you typically find in a day? In a day. Ooh. So when they're on the Antarctica missions, they can they can find. Because I know that's when that's yeah. when we're only that's when we're really hunting for meteorites is mm -hmm. during that time of year. Yeah, they they can find. I mean, so there's some days where they don't find any, and then there's some days where they find tens, tens of meteorites. I know um, this. Uh, I think how many do they find a season? I guess a season is a like collection. It just, it just depends on sort of where they go. Um, but they, some, some seasons they bring back just a few, uh, usually a few hundred. Okay. It's not a lot. There's been seasons where it's been about like 150, and then there's been seasons where they've got like 800. So. Wow. That's a great question, San Benito High. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sneeds Ferry Homeschool is, why is the meteorite mostly iron? Oof. I don't know the answer to that one, actually. See, like I'm just beginning to study to myself, so I, I'm not full of a lot of information on this specific. And is that where they're just where they're at in this the solar system? Yeah. Okay. And and it's gonna be sort of iron as itself. It's not gonna like if you find iron on the earth or in the earth, uh, if you're mining for it, it's gonna be in like ore body. So you're gonna have iron mixed with something else. Uh, with a lot of the meteorites, you're just gonna have this is, this is iron. Kind of Just thing. pure iron. Wow, that's a good one. Okay. But that's just, uh, but a specific iron meteorite is one classification. Like there's all these other different classifications of meteorites. I remember this because when I started looking at meteorites, I kept getting really confused because there were so many and the abbreviations. Yeah, there's so, <laughs> yeah, you're normally going to have, so you're going to have those irons, you're, you're going to have ordinary chondrites, and then you're going to have and uh, or not ordinary, but you have chondrites, and then you're going to have achondrites. And the achondrites are meteorites that don't have chondrules. And those are that's all the different kinds, or no? No, those are some oh, of the no. bigger. Those are some of the bigger like umbrella? umbrella terms. That's a lot of meteorites. Uh, so we have about we're kind of at the end of the hour, and I know some of you might have to go. So I wanted to take a minute um, to wrap up with you guys, since we do have just. Like a, I think literally one minute left. Um, I know we haven't quite gotten to all your questions, but thank you so much for joining us today. Curtis, thank you for taking time out from the lab and Breaking Rocks, your favorite, okay. to come talk to us today and for you know giving us so much information about meteorites around the labs here in Aries, the meteorite labs, um, the study of meteorites, how to become a meteorite scientist. Um, you're kind of making me want to go back to collecting rocks. Also, all of you guys out, out there still collecting rocks um, are also making me regret giving my collection away to my younger brother. So might have to call him and see about getting that back. 
but thank you all for joining us. If you have to go, I totally understand. Um, if you want to, we will be on for another kind of 15 minutes, just answering a few more questions, um, chatting a little bit more. But otherwise, thank you guys. It is 12 o'clock here, so I think 1 o'clock EST. Um, and then backwards on down the line if you're going to the Pacific Coast. Um, but thank you for joining us if you have to go. And otherwise, do you want to keep answering some questions? Sure, I've got a few more minutes. Awesome. This has been a lot of fun. This is, this is a lot of fun. These questions are really good. Um, okay. Sneak Fairy, thank you. Yeah, thank you. You guys have a great day. You guys are awesome. Uh, I think is I thought I saw Duxbury leaving as well. Um, Otis Field, thank you as well. You guys had some hard-hitting questions. Downs <laughs> Elementary and the Forestry Institute. I had you guys were killer. I had more questions, and I think you guys were you guys. I, I some journalists out here, some science journalists. Definitely. <laughs> and then okay, I wanted to kind of go back. There was another really good question in the Q and A. Um, let me see. Somebody was asking about, do you find any scientists outside of NASA that study other rocks? Yes, so let's answer that in two different ways. We, at, at NASA, we have a lot of scientists that study um, meteorites and moon rocks and just astro materials. And then we have scientists at other institutions that also study these same things, but there are also scientists at these other institutions that study terrestrial rocks. So earth rocks. Exactly. So awesome. we, they'll study volcanoes, they'll study beaches for the like sand. Like you did with your master's work, you studied yeah. that rock from Montana. Exactly. Got it, okay. And when people are studying earth rocks, do you, are there comparisons to, because I know you went from studying earth rocks to space rocks, are there comparisons we can make between Earth and space there, rocks? There are. There's some of the, a lot of the minerals will be similar. Oh. Um, and so there would kind of be an analog, sort of a, something we can relate to between the different rocks. Um, but it, it definitely helps to have that background. Um, that's really cool. And I'm, let's see, I know a couple of these people have left, but if they pulled on the archive recording, um, that one right there. Uh, Otis Field Community School had asked, have you found meteorites from other planets than Mars and the Moon? So they have found, so we have meteorites that are uh, thought to be from asteroid bodies, Vesta. Okay. Uh, I think there may be another one, but that's a big one. A lot of people are really and excited about that one. Is Vesta just like a really big asteroid? Yes. Okay. And so that's why we, that's why we mm -hmm. have maybe more from it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have we found others from like planetary bodies yet? No, I don't believe, not, that, not to my knowledge. Oh, that was such a good one. Also, if anybody is uh, still with us, you're welcome to pose some more questions in the Q&A. We are still reading them. Um, so keep on asking. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going back through some of these other um, past questions. Uh, let's see. Um, how many people work on our team was also from Otis Hill Community School, but I really like that question. How many people are on the meteorite team? Yeah, so in the lab, we have uh, about five of us that, okay. can, that work in there. Um, usually about three of us are in there on a daily basis because there's a lot of other things that go on dealing with this lab. So you um, don't just get to break rocks as part of exactly. your job. Exactly. There's a lot of paperwork that goes into it. Any, anytime, <laughs> we, anytime we touch a rock, we kind of have to document what we've done to that rock. Then do you, so you said that you liked art history because you it taught you how to kind of sketch out at least some of the things. Do you draw the rocks when you break them? or No, we take pictures. Okay, so that seems a little bit more. It's a little bit easier. Yeah, a little, a little bit faster and more scientific, exactly. maybe, to document things. Uh, and let's check. Um, anybody else? I've got some more up here. How can you tell the difference between a Mars rock and a lunar rock from Randall Middle School? That's a good one. All right, so. The, the, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pose that to you in terms of because I know we have lunar meteorites and I know we have Mars meteorites. So when you're looking at those. And I know they don't just talk to you and tell you that they're how how do you look at those? How do you test those? So for the Martian meteorites, we know that they're from Mars because we have they, they found little glass inclusions on these Martian meteorites, and there was gas trapped in those meteorites, and they were able to tie it back to what the probes had analyzed of the Martian atmosphere. So they were able to tie back. What? Uh, a sort of relation <laughs> between those meteorites and the Martian atmosphere. So now they're believed to be from Mars. 
Oh, so the probe data that we sent, like on the ro like on the the robots that went to yeah, Mars. The, the probe and the rovers, they collected some data, and we were able to tie them back. What? And then for the moon, we of course have samples from the moon, so we were able to sort of be like, hey, this looks like the same sort of material, and it is. Oh, okay, so we were able to tie it back with physical with because physical, we have exactly. That's really cool. <laughs> oh, and Duxbury Senior Center asked. Um, have we stopped doing analysis on ALH 84001? Okay. Oh, I, I'm, that's a very specific question that I'm not familiar with. Um, they would have, is that in our, the uh, trigger that database? Was, that, um, I would assume it is, but, uh, yeah, but, um, I, that's a very specific question that I don't really know the, uh, that is the a very special to, media yeah, page, yeah. A lot of people have wanted to look at that one for a long time, and I think a lot of people are still looking at it, but I don't know any specifics. Okay, and that's a really good question, though. Thank you. Let's see. We've got that one. Um, how many scientists collect meteorites in Antarctica? So I believe the team this year, the teams are usually made up of about, uh, I believe, six to eight people, I want to say. And I remember they don't all have to be scientists. Like, you could be from exactly. a lot of different backgrounds. So, mm -hmm. so six to eight people. I, I think, yeah, and then they usually have guides. <laughs> six to eight enthusiastic rock people. <laughs> exactly. And then they usually have guides as well. So it'll be, so of that, about eight man team or eight woman man team person, crew. person. <laughs> an eight person crew <laughs> you know because there are a lot of women that go down there too that's awesome so anybody can get involved and they'll have a lot of guys as well so of that eight person crew some of them will be guys i think maybe half or something okay and those are guides are the people that have are those um that have done it before or are those people that have maybe Yes. Just seasoned seasoned veterans of the yeah. the trade. <laughs> seasoned veterans of the hiking <laughs> like, around in Antarctica. <clears throat> I have lived in the snow and I don't want to go back. It was too cold for me. <laughs> uh, do we have any other questions? I want to make sure I take you guys' questions first, but I also have a few more too as well. All right. Let's see. We've got oh, I did that one. Let's see. We asked the labs program, the scientists one. Oh, that one you just got again. That was a great question. While I go through these and double check them, can you uh, explain a little bit about, or I guess, for anybody else who's still waiting for, or who's still in the line with us, who's maybe trying to think of really burning questions or questions to stump us, because <laughs> I feel like that might be also part of the theme now. Um, what advice would you give to anybody who's trying to become a meteorite scientist or even just a geologist? Like if I wanted to go back and I was just like, no, never mind, yeah. and wanted to go back into rocks, where would what advice would you give me? Well, uh, take your science like. Get interested in science, all right? If, if you're not already, then you know, start, start, start getting interested. There's, and there's a lot of different fields that are very exciting. You know, there's biology and chemistry. And in geology, we incorporate a lot of different uh, fields. We incorporate you know, physics, biology, chemistry, all in geology, because it is the study of the Earth. Um, and so take, take, a, take a lot of science courses. And then again, you know, always take your uh, literature classes seriously as well. <laughs> yeah, if you've got to write descriptions of meteorites, right? yeah. so you need to you need to keep that thesaurus. <laughs> exactly. Oh, do you so um, with that in mind, like, do you do a lot of writing around them? Like, does that does that help? Like, to become a scientist is that you know you said earlier that that was something that was really helpful to you, um, like a non STEM class to take yes. was writing and creative writing and things like that to be able to write about a lot of the meteorites and. Yes, exactly. Because uh, we have to write every day. Uh, we always are always writing descriptions of the the uh, samples in the laboratory. And then for my research, for my thesis and, and master's, 
uh, I had to do a lot of writing there too, so it helps to learn how to communicate, especially with a lot of the scientific terminology. And I guess, um, what is your favorite, because we've talked a lot about the rocks and like, I mean, they're very near and dear to me, but yes. do you have a favorite non-rock hobby that you enjoy? Like, or are all your hobbies related to rocks? Not all of them are related okay. to rocks, uh, but yes, so my friends and I like to play video games when we're not doing geology work. Whenever you're playing video games, because um, I studied a lot of history, so yes. whenever I'm playing video games, a lot of times my friends will tell me to not talk about anything that's ahistorical or is historically inaccurate in the video games. Do you ever play the video games and make comments about the rocks in the video games? Oh, oh, oh definitely. <laughs> Especially if my other geology friends are playing. Oh, no. the game, we will look around to the atmosphere in the game and be like, and just say, yeah, that uh, that rock doesn't look like it formed, you know, by the manner that the game said it has formed. Or like this just, is a waterfall. That's not how that rock was formed. Yeah, going. or <laughs> we'll just look at mountains will look a little off or something like that. So what you're saying is you really don't get away from rocks 100%. And you do still, okay, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only person who has to be banished from making, <laughs> making comments about my passion in my hobbies. And does anybody else have any questions or does anybody else want to have comments or chat with us a little bit? Going through some of the questions. Oh, uh, Otis Field also asked like colleges or programs that have strong Geology meteorite. I know you said you went to University, University of is pretty good. Houston, and uh, they have a very large program. Uh, I believe Michigan has a large program. University of Texas and then Texas A&M, and I know. I mean, I know these schools because they're Texas schools, so they're all they all have very large. It's, programs. it's easy to know what's in our backyard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, all, they all have very. I've had friends from those programs, and they all tell me that they're very good. But we have people from all different universities. Oh. Um, from all over the United States within our labs. You can always Google geology program US. I had a professor at UH that's from MIT. Ah, we had a geology program there? How did I miss this? I just, and then that's a good one. We are almost out of time, so if you have any more burning questions, the clock is ticking. I'm going to see if I can't get one more. Let's see. There's a couple of these are kind of comments. All right, guys. That looks like it's it. I think that's kind of it. But thank you so much again to everybody who joined us today. If you do have any other questions or you wanted to or you think of something after the end of the interview, you're welcome to email me and I will try my best to get things answered. Um, no guarantees on how quickly we can get them answered or how long it takes us to find the answer to those, but we will do our best. Um, thank you so much for joining us, uh, taking the time out of your day. It's been a privilege to talk to all of you. Um, you had some really good questions uh, and you've stumped us a couple of times, which I feel like is the best part of learning is exactly. finding out what you don't know so that you can go find it out. Yeah. And Curtis, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. It's been a pleasure to hang out with you. It's been a blast. But yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I've been taking notes this whole time, and I've got, I've got my work cut out for me because I've got to be able to talk about this to other people, and I don't know a lot of this. So, off to the curator websites for me to go do some googling and some looking up. Um, but otherwise, thank you, everybody. It's been wonderful. Thank you, and thank, thank you. you to Paige and. Suzanne and everybody for running this webinar on the other side of the campus. You guys have been awesome. Um, have a wonderful day and we will see you next time. Don't forget that we have uh, other webinars coming up this year and they'll be advertised on the website. We will see you later. Bye.